Welcome to The Entrepreneur Next Door. This is Zev Ash, and it's my pleasure to welcome Steve Breaker. Uh, Steve, again, like many of my guests, is not quite the entrepreneur next door. Uh, he's in Kenya, uh, in Africa. And Steve, welcome. Please, uh, in one minute or less, introduce yourself. Firstly, thank you very much for having me, Zev. It's an honor. Secondly, uh, my name is Steve Breaker. Uh, I'm an action thriller author living in Kenya, East Africa. I've lived here for 20 years. Uh, I've brought my children up here. I've run my own businesses here. Uh, I'm currently semi-retired and, uh, and writing books. Uh, although over the years I've been heavily involved in the uh, small businesses of Kenya, I, I ran a marina for many years. I've run some aid programs for... Uh, for several aid agencies. I have run a lawyer's office, which I still do. Um, and I expanded into some property development over the last five years or so. So basically I, I sort of, an, I'm an entrepreneur on all levels, but mostly nowadays I try and be an author. Great, so welcome again. And it's actually the pleasure is mine because I am a, an avid action thriller, uh, um, book reader um, and I came across you through Growth Mentor and I've started to read your books and I am absolutely a fan so it is actually my Fantastic. honor to speak to somebody who writes the kind of books that I love to read so Steve let's jump let's go back in history quickly to uh, you know if you were 14 years old and we were having a conversation and I said Steve what do you want to be when you grow up what would you have told me then when I was 14 years old, I, I had a, a, a dream which I've maintained mostly throughout all of my life. And I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to have enough money to live comfortably by the age of 50. And I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew I was going to do it. Um, so I would have been very clear with you on that day that uh, I knew exactly where I was going. And I knew I had a very clear ideology but my route wasn't wasn't very clear at that point so uh, you know a 14 year old when you when and, and I ask my guests that question all the time there's actually a specific uh, either a profession or specific occupation that they that they pick um, how does a 14 year old have the 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 maturity at that age to say, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I want to retire at 50. <laughs> right? That's unusual. <laughs> where does I, I start? So I'm sorry, Steve. So my question is like, where does that come from? Right? So usually we are byproduct of how our parents raise us. And most of our parents raise us to, you know, go to school, study hard, go to university, get a get a degree in something, build a future, right? That's not what you're saying, though. No, my I think I was some sort of an anomaly in my family because uh, my father was a civil servant. He was he was a firefighter and my mother was a stay at home mom. But from the age of six or seven, I was entrepreneurial. I was the one selling things in school, uh, trying to figure out deals while I was still in school. I started my paper round at 12 years old. I was we, I lived in Cornwall in England, so I was working on the farms at 13. I was chasing money from a very early age, but I didn't enjoy the idea of a formal job. I, I was too, my brain wasn't really settled towards the idea of, of a formal employment. I could never see, even from a very young age, that that would uh, fulfill me. And I didn't have the brains. Back in those days, they were very clear with you about your educational, the way forward in your education. And my teacher said to me, you're not going to university, Steve, so you can forget that straight off the bat. So I knew that being a doctor or an engineer or an accountant were not really in my future. <laughs> so uh, I, I thought I can either become a bricklayer or I can actually go out there and try and earn some money. So we fast forward to you finish high school, which is sort of 
I guess we can can consider it mandatory. And yeah. so did you go to university or you just skip that? No, as I said, my uh, my the teachers, the career advisors that we had back in the day, back in England, back then said, forget it. It's a waste of your time, Steve. You might as well go out into the world and see what you can do. So I became a silversmith then. Uh, I trained with a local silversmith to make uh, uh, things for churches, like uh, candelabras and uh, vases and things like that for churches and for uh, other uh, individual clients. But I soon realized that that was exactly what I didn't want to do because that was a fixed income and I was just selling my time for money. Uh, and uh, it didn't, it lasted, I did the full uh, three years of the apprenticeship, but as soon as it was over, I, I was gone. I became a salesman. I started selling double glazing. <laughs> selling what? Double glazing, you know, the plastic windows with the two sheets of glass. Oh, okay. In All England, right. that's uh, in England, that's uh, you knock on people's doors and you you sit in their house and you try to convince them to buy windows. <laughs> that that's tough, actually. I'm I'm actually working with a company that does that in in the New York area, and uh, that's quite. I would say that's a brutal business. That is. This is yeah, as yeah. tough as selling used cars in some respect, right? Exactly. And, yeah, and yeah. so you're going door to door selling windows. How, how yeah. did you do? I did very well. And I realized that was another sort of pivotal point in my life that uh, A, if you knock enough doors, you'll find people. You, you have to learn to accept the word no uh, most of the time. But the percentage that... Um, the, the salesman gets means that in a single evening I could earn almost as much as I did in two weeks working as a silversmith as long as I was prepared to knock on the 200 doors to get to that uh, to get to that one person that was interested in buying so it taught me that first of all be very careful how you sell your time be very very cautious with that because you can get caught into a trap where you uh, you end up spending 30, selling them 30 years and not really getting a great deal back. I also learned that uh, basically uh, everything is up to me. That there's, there's nobody else helping me out really in this world. You just got to knock the doors and keep knocking the doors on your own, whether it's raining or whether it's sunny. And, uh, and make sure that uh, somebody says yes in the end. So I think what I find intriguing in your story um, is that, well, you just said in the last 20, 30 seconds, the realization that your life is truly is in your own control and you don't want to let other people control you. Uh, that level of maturity doesn't come that quickly to most people, right? Uh, there's some some people that get into their mid thirties, go through the regular channels, the regular path, and then they wake up one day and, and they get to the same point you did. Or if you have the entrepreneurial spirit, which many of my guests, all of my guests have, and many of my uh, listening audience has, um, yeah, you get to a point where you say, okay, I've had enough with this job thing. I'm gonna go off on my own, take a chance of charting my own future and I'm in charge, right? But you got there at a, I'm guessing, relatively young age, but you didn't, you didn't listen to Tony Robbins. You didn't listen to Gary Vandachak. You, you did this on your own, uh, which I found intriguing. Yeah. Gary wasn't around then. He of was course. still a young <laughs> child. <laughs> but Tony Robbins was, uh, was around, and there were others. I did read books back in the, those days, which were more... Uh, I, I read Eckhart Tolle and people like that, which, which advocate being yourself and being your own person and taking responsibility for your life. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, that's the golden rule that I was very luckily open to learning at, at, before I was 20 years old. So as soon as you, as soon as you adopt that uh, ideology, then uh, working for other people becomes very difficult 
because I, I've always done other, you know, I've done things. Sometimes I've been broken. I've had to work at a cafe or I've had to wash dishes or I've had to clean offices or whatever. But um, you, you can never stay long because you're always looking for your freedom to make your own decisions. And you so, can't be tied down. So I want to fast forward a little bit and get to a point where you make a decision to relocate, right? And move to Kenya from England, yeah. um, which is a, uh, a, a bold move for anybody relocating from their home country, right? Uh, I've done it a couple of times. I can sort of relate, but uh, I've moved from Israel to the US. I didn't go to an African country, which is a completely different culture, different environment, very, very different, right? Were you, and I think you said you moved to Kenya with your, your, your family. Yes. So yes, what- Four children and my wife. Four children and your wife. What, what propelled you to make that kind of a move? I was working in central London. I owned an English language school at that point uh, in Leicester Square, which is the center of London. And my children were growing up in, in just north of London, but still very much in the city. And, and they weren't living a good life. They were living a life that was uh, very city orientated. And I didn't believe, having been brought up in the countryside myself, I didn't believe it was a very, very viable solution for them. I didn't believe they would get to make the choices and decisions and see the things and have the experiences that I really wanted them to have. And at that time, my wife was from Kenya. She'd been brought, born in England, but she was, uh, her parents uh, were Kenyan. And we just, I just sat at home one day and I was looking at my kids and I thought, well, it's, I'm 35 years old. I've got one adventure, proper adventure left in me. I'm going to do this. I had quite a lot of money in the bank. I sold my business. And three months later, I was in Mombasa looking for work. <laughs> <laughs> so... You're doing the right thing for your kids, uh, but we, we've all been kids at a dead age. Uh, how old were the kids, if I can ask? You? My, my eldest was eight and my youngest was two. Okay, so the two we can, we can remove from this conversation because they're too young together, but the eight-year-old is, is that of an age where they're aware of their surrounding. They have a, somewhat of a network of friends, and then you pluck them out of out of one country and they land in a completely different world where uh, everybody is very different than, than people in England, right? Um, yeah. So this was sort of a, uh, a, a, a tough, a, not tough, but a bold, courageous decision based on sort of faith that Kenya can deliver what you had in mind for your family? Not really. I, I believe that I could deliver. Wherever you put me, I can deliver what my family need. And we'd, we'd spent several holidays in Kenya, so it wasn't just a sticking a pin in a map and mm -hmm. jumping on an airplane. We did know the area. And I'd studied the language, and I'd also studied the economic sort of setup that was here. And even now, today, for a relatively brave person, a developing country has a lot to offer if, if you're willing to roll up your sleeves and get involved. Um, we, there's so many things that are going on in, in any of our East African countries here that if, if you've got a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit, and you're, you're brave enough to tackle things that maybe you haven't seen before, you could really leap forward very, very quickly. And I'd already noticed that when I was on holiday, that the opportunities here were, were much bigger than even the opportunities in central London. So I felt in myself that I had a lot of confidence and, uh, uh, in my own abilities, but I'd also had a look at the environment. And I knew roughly where I was going to go, which was going to be Mombasa. And I knew 
sort of where I was going to aim for, which was the boating industry, which I already knew something about. And I believed, like all of us entrepreneurs do, that I could do better than the guy next door. So uh, my next question was going to be, so you move your family now, you, you made that decision feeling that it's really on your shoulder to make it work. And so you now have to, as an entrepreneur, I'm assuming, you have to jump in with both feet and two hands and start earning a living in Mombasa. And I think you said you, you had some familiarity with boating. So is that what you did? Yes, yes. I approached uh, a rundown boatyard that I'd found in a small town just outside of the island of Mombasa. Uh, the town is called Matwapa. Um, and the boatyard had not been run properly. And I, in my business is that I'd run in the UK, I'd become quite an expert on monitoring and running businesses and also doing the finances because I was very keen on, on those areas. And I believed those areas were fundamental in making a business work. So I just, I made them an offer, a ridiculously low offer at the time to rent their premises. And uh, they were in a position where they weren't going anywhere and they just agreed. So I took the place for 15 years and very quickly built it up because again, in, in a developing country, if, if you bring in modern management techniques and you bring in uh, proper structured financial systems, then you can make changes very, very quickly. Um, I'm a huge advocate of people coming to these countries and trying, because if, as I say, if you're brave enough and you're a bit strong-minded, which most entrepreneurs are, then because you're bringing skills from the Western world, you can, you can really take over very quickly and, and develop them and develop the industry around you. And that's what I found uh, within six months, we were turning a good profit. So, so Steve, from a, I, I, can, I can understand it from a opportunity cost, uh, the, the financial barriers, if you're coming in with some funds from, from the UK, because the cost of doing business, the cost of living, I'm assuming is much lower in Mombasa, in Kenya, yes. then your money gets to work for you in a much, much larger way that's an advantage but uh the the one piece that i'm curious about is you still have to work with local the local community and how do they are they open-minded to accept you so here's this foreigner guy lending here and come and tell me how to run my business and he's going to give me some money to do it well fine so you can invest in a business but then you still need the employees the workers to adapt to, to the levels of efficiencies that you need to make to make a profit. So uh, were they open to it? Was that easy? Yeah, very, very open to it. I, admittedly, I'd studied Swahili before I arrived. So when, when I arrived, I was able to speak to them. I wasn't just being an Englishman and just shouting at them. I was actually speaking in Swahili and talking to them. And that if you sit down and learn and understand their ways, uh, the people here on the coast don't really work for money. They work for the person. So they have to respect you. The, the money is almost a side issue. And you have to respect their culture very, very deeply. For instance, if someone has uh, an emotional issue here, like a funeral or a wedding or a sick child or a sick mother or whatever, that's an automatic stop of work for them. So you have to be able to understand the culture that uh, it's not like the Western world where you get two days off for a funeral, this can be a month. And you have to cater for them and look after them during that period. If you do that, and if you listen to them and work with them, then when they come back, they're, they're with you for life. Yeah, they're, they're sort of stalwart workers for life. And they don't follow the clock. But again, you just have to work with that. Hmm. Start I, time uh, <laughs> is different to normal start times. And <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is so this is so brilliant, Steve. Honestly, because 
you know, and, and you alluded to this a couple of seconds ago, we come from, we, we live, well, I live, we live in the Western world uh, where all business uh, disciplines are controlled by this magical, not magical, this this HR thing that that creates boundaries and bureaucracies, and you're right. If you want, you know, there's if if it's a sophisticated company and they address all the issues that employees have, then yes, if somebody passes in your family, maybe we'll give you, you know, up to three four days, and you can have family family leave to take care of your sick mom or your sick wife. But those are all tiny little droplets of of empathy that the corporation gives to employees. And I, I think what you said is, is, is true even, so you have to do what you have to do and then you come back four days later to work, but you're still living in your own personal situation. It did not go away. So you physically at work, mentally you're not there. Uh, I can tell you that I, I somewhat can relate because you know my dad was in Israel and he was in a nursing home and, uh, had to go to an operation and I flew out to, to be with him. And I can only spend a week there because that was my time. And if you say, well, you could spend two weeks, but you're not going to get paid for it. Right. Yes. As if you, if you don't have that luxury of staying as long as you want and not getting paid, um, that's a problem. And I remember leaving him when he was uh, in tears and saying, I'm and apologizing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have to go back to work. It was an awful, awful long 12-hour flight back for me from Israel back to, to the state. So that's sure. that that's a really interesting concept. It's not it's not interesting, it's revealing of when you do the right thing for your employees, you said something, they're yours for life. And and 98% of businesses in the US, especially people that I work with, just miss that point. It's all everything is. There's nothing for nothing, right? It's always a zero-sum game. You'll do this, yeah, yeah. and I'll give you that. So uh, you you take over the boat yard. Uh, was that is that building boats? What what exactly was that? Uh, the tourist is industry on the coast here is very big, and obviously the the water. We have a, a lovely quiet ocean here with a with a a reef, so we have a big lagoons. So there's a lot of boating. So we did general repairs. We built wooden dows, big wooden dows for tourism for the tourism industry and some for the uh, for the for the Swahilis to use on the coast. Uh, we repaired fiberglass boats and we repaired engines, two-stroke and four-stroke engines. And then we looked after the boats because it was a marina, so we had had them parked there and we kept them clean and uh, mm -hmm. kept them up maintained properly. So we had a very quickly, I had I had about a hundred boats from from about twenty to a hundred very quickly, so that gave me a steady income to to pay everybody and pay the rent and uh, even give myself a small amount, and then I would make the money on the rebuilds and the refurbishments and uh, selling of engines and selling of parts. So I don't know what was the turning point or or the moment of revelation to you where you start to write action thriller books do you remember what that point was i was in england when i started writing because i was an english teacher and i ran an english language school i was the owner and at that point i was writing small short stories but when i came to kenya they kind of went on to the back burner for for other reasons, your family's growing up, you're running to school, you're doing a business, you, you, you just lose all of your own sort of hobby time, it's just gone. But then when my children started leaving home, my, my time started coming back quite quickly. And I was finding myself with a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of time on my hands. And I, I don't, I'm a fisherman, I like scuba diving, I like uh, fishing. I like boating, obviously, but th then in the evenings, those things are daytime things. So in the evenings, I was getting a bit bored. So I just sort of went back through my short stories and an idea came from my boating and my, and I'm like you, I'm an avid reader of action and adventure stories. But I was reading so many that I was starting to think, hey, this is all getting the same. I think I could 
I could chip in here and maybe offer a different direction for readers to go in. That combined with my boating and my uh, sort of adventures along the coast here gave me a kernel of an idea to uh, start writing books. And also I was dead keen on this digital world. I, 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 I'm so in love with the, the ability for us to talk right now it is, it just blows my mind. And to be able to sit in my flat in Mombasa and, and generate an income from Americans it is actually, it's just like for, for an entrepreneur. And for me, it was just absolutely the, the opportunity of the century. So I sat down and I looked at other ways. Everybody looks at other ways on the internet. And obviously I was limited because of my location. But if you want to do drop shipping or all these other things, you have to have a, a location in a country such as yours or England. So I, I thought, well, I love writing. I enjoy this. I've got this kernel of an idea. I'm going to give it a shot and see, uh, see if I can make it work. So but when because we, we went quickly through your your personal history from being a kid in England who wants to make money in entrepreneurial stuff to getting married, having kids, relocating. Um, there was nothing in in what we've covered that had to do with Steve trying his hands with MI6 or working as a spy somewhere in Saudi Arabia on behalf of some other countries. Where did you get, so, so, so before I, uh, the question is how did you get to writing the type of action thriller books that you write? Um, but maybe before that, the question is who inspired you when you were reading those kind of books? Who was your favorite author? Uh, when I was younger, it was Clive Cussler. He, he was the, mm. the, in the 60s, he wrote, started writing in the late 60s, but he was the, the king of that sort of genre and placing every, placing the things together. And also he was quite exotic for that time because he didn't just write about America. He was, he wrote about all over the world. Uh, which which was they were fun books. I, I still read them today because they're just really they're, they're a bit dated now. Although he keep his his family keep putting them out, uh, I, I still enjoy Clive Cussler. But then I read I read Lee Child, uh, mm, lovely for Child. action and adventure. Another another everybody reads him. Um, I, I've read a, a lot of uh, Patterson. I read a lot because he did he did outside of his country type. Mm -hmm. type stories um I, I read a lot of as many as i could get my hands on i can't recall them all now but i i had a i would read one i still do i always have a book on my now i have them on my telephone because we can't buy the hardbacks here or the or the paperbacks here so I, I read electronically but i always have a book on the go uh and i usually i read quite a lot of the modern authors now which which mm -hmm. are which are good i enjoy them but it was that that created the the uh, the tough guy in my thrillers, the William Brody. It was the it wasn't anything I've ever done. It was what, I, I kind of mingled what what I've read and how that sort of uh, how that genre works and how the protagonist has to be, and then I tied it into my experiences on the coastline here because I've sailed and dived and. Well, if you're here and you're you're open to ideas, there's always things cropping up. As I said earlier, there's always opportunities. So I've been, I've sailed boats, Salamu, I've sailed boats up to Somalia. I've worked in Mogadishu. I've been along the Tana River collecting crocodile eggs. I've camped in the game parks. You know, I've done lots of things that uh, can, if you've got a furtive imagination, you can then grow stories from. And also I studied the culture and the people a lot, which I, I try and include in my books, the, the language and how, how people live here, because a lot of people have a good understanding, but there are a considerable amount of people that have never been to Africa, have never been to Kenya. They don't know what it's like. And I try and include that in my story. So I had sort of three or four buckets, which I can always start picking from. And uh, 
I always, uh, my protagonist though, is purely from the, the books I've read uh, and uh, the stories that I've, I've enjoyed. And he comes from there. Hmm. So I've never been an MI6 agent. <laughs> so, um, so let me ask you a question, because I'm obviously, I'm also a writer, not, not an action thriller, more writing business book, although I do have one nonfiction uh, one fiction book that I started 15 years ago, and it's a third through, never got to finish it, but I will one day. Um, Good. But, so I think you said, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what are the ingredients for someone to become a, an action thriller writer. So you said you need to have a, a vivid imagination, number one. Number two, uh, in your case, I think again because this is a, it's an entrepreneurial podcast. We talk about business and marketing. Your ability, your way, the way you differentiate your books from others is they they the action takes place in part of the world that for most of us is it, still a mystery, right? We we can relate to stories in Russia and in the Middle East and in the U.S., but. Africa is one of these things where you know where it is. Maybe somebody can point on the map, but we have clueless about that. So you introduce an interesting dynamics to all this stuff that you used to read, read about with Lee Child or anybody else that could actually happen in Africa. So location, vivid imagination. You're an English teacher, so you have to have some writing skills, although... I think many authors say that they stink at writing and then the editor fixes it, right? So Yeah, that's yeah. very true. So, Even if you're good at grammar, the editor still fixes everything. Correct. <laughs> um, so how, how long have you done the writing piece? I started in 2016 with uh, the very first book, which was a very, very thin book because I didn't, uh, I didn't understand plot plotting and um, mm -hmm. extending stories and descriptions very well for a novel. That was a novella. Um, but then I went on some courses, online courses, and I read some books, which helped me develop my, my storytelling and my actually extending a plot and making the story more interesting. So it's been a sort of a slow, gradual increase. My first book was very, very short. The second book was a little bit longer. Now on to the fifth book, which I've just released, uh, African Vengeance, which is 100,000 words. And then the next book, which I'm halfway through now, will probably be around the same. It's sort of a growth within yourself, uh, learning how to describe things, because we tend to do it too quickly when we're first involved, almost like talking. We, we don't, we, we're not very hugely descriptive when we talk. So you have to learn how to plot and how to uh, make things, make story, extend stories in an interesting way that the reader will enjoy following along because the reader wants to get involved in the story and, and live in there for, you know, the, the hundred thousand words, however fast they read. But that, that for me can be, because I pick a book up and put it down, that can be for me a week or so, or, or a week or 10 days of reading. So I'm involved in that story and those people's lives for that period of time. So I think it's important to learn to plot and, mm -hmm. and extend your stories and introduce interesting things as often as possible. And I, I, so I think as a reader, I think there are two types of audiences that read these kind of books. They are the people like me who want to move through the pages relatively quickly with action and can't wait to turn the page digitally or otherwise to get to see what happens. Uh, and then there is the other group of, of readers that like, like that genre, but they're, they're obsessed with the details, right? So I remember my first Tom Clancy book that I read uh, may have been uh, the hunt for it October. I don't remember. Uh, and it was quite fascinating because he gets into very, very technical details. And three to four books later, uh, I forgot one book he came up with was like 600 pages. I don't remember what it was. 
uh, I was really struggling because I want to, I, I tend to skip over some of this overly descriptive yeah. data because it's not me, but some people love that piece. And I remember he mm -hmm. was on Larry King on CNN one day and, and Larry King opened the, 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 the interview for some questions. And some, one of the callers said to, to Tom Clancy, you know, I, I love your books and I admire everything you do. But in this latest book, you know, there was a, the, the protagonist was in a boat and it was there, there was like a, a thinking process and he said, why did it have to take 20 pages to go through that where it just doesn't make sense, right? Um, mm. And that's sort of like the, the challenging thing that, that it's not that you have the challenge, you, you just cater to the people that love, like me, who love to move around the book with intrigue yeah. and action and then every other page is something new that comes on but it keeps moving uh and eventually i i left clancy because i, I i'm not interested in the overly detail of the sig horror gun and exactly what makes up the guy you know fine it's a gun and just use it and shoot somebody that's fine with me uh yeah but the other piece for you and again as a self-publisher clearly on the non-fiction business side but you decide to be an action thriller and you're jumping into a really, really big pool with lots of sharks in it. Yes, you know, the challenge, very, very true. And the challenge for you, of course, is how do you build up loyal readership from people like me who are who tend to just follow their favorite authors all the time? Like Lee Child, I can't wait for him to come back with a new book because I love his books. So this comes mm -hmm. on, boom, done. Um, uh, so then there are a few others. How do you build up you're sort of your your customer loyalty audience when it's such a challenging, difficult industry to be in or area, right? Yeah, I agree. I chose for some unknown reason, I chose the action thriller genre, which which has some brilliant writers in it, and and people will fall in love with with a, an author like yourself and me and follow them diligently for years and years and years. Basically, where I am now, I'm at the beginning of my journey. I'm, I'm only a few years in. I, I, if you read the book by Stephen King on writing, he, he spent years and years just going through the motions, trying to get published back then. Obviously, he was a traditional publisher. But it, it's, 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 um, it's back to entrepreneurial, really. It's the last man standing. You just have to keep on going and not become disillusioned. My books get read. I get a, a small income per month out of them, which is growing steadily over the years. And I just have to keep promoting myself and I just have to keep churning out. The most important thing is to churn out a nice, enjoyable, readable book that balances with what my readers tend to like, which most of them are more like you than, than the people who like the Clancy books. They, they prefer... They don't want to get bored in the middle, you know, they, they want to keep the story moving and keep keep on going. I do a bit of descriptive stuff, but most of it is uh, tight, as tight as I can make it. But it's just keep going, keep writing, believe in yourself and know that you're, you're going to get there if you keep on knocking on doors, just like in the beginning of my story. If you keep on knocking on doors, in the end, I've met you now and uh, you're reading my books. It's just one more candle. One more candle in the church. That's all I'm trying to light every well, day. Well, if you, I mean, if you follow, uh, you know, my mentor for many, many years, Seth Godin, you know, his, one of his books was called Ideas That Spread. But the whole, the, the crux of his marketing belief is that, that you grow by, because people talk about your service, your product, your approach. That's the, the organic growth is the best way to grow any business. But in a universe that's filled with noise and so many competitors and traditional publisher, traditional authors that are backed by mega million publishers who spend a ton of money on marketing them. Uh, I mean, even within Amazon, in my little universe with my the book I released almost a year ago, and I this time studied the whole concept of self-publishing and marketing, uh, it's a completely, it's a separate entity from the world. Yes, same idea, but it's filled with the same scammers and and 
coaches and tips and tricks of how to make your number one best sell with none of it work. None of it works. They're just going to take your money. I've had people ask me for twelve to fifteen thousand dollars to help my book become a bestseller and for me exactly. to become a sought after speaker. You know, it, this this pie in the sky thing. I'm not saying that it doesn't work, but you know because that's something you do, and I know it marginally because I wrote a book not to make money because I know there's no money to be made in in, in self publishing yeah. on, particularly on on the non-fiction side, fiction side. So um, the point is, there is no logical economic sense to give somebody $12,000 on the hope and dreams, hopes and dreams that you're going to be a famous author one day. You are never going to make that money back. The return investment will be zero because it's such a challenging thing. So what it's left for you, you can't ignore the marketing piece. But there are things you can do, even as an unknown, relatively unknown author, that that you can do and you're doing to increase the organic push of people getting to know you. And one way to do it is to say, uh, okay, here is, you like action thrillers. Well, here is a style of, of writing that is different than your traditional one. It takes place in a completely different continent. Uh, mm-hmm. the, the protagonist is not your god that came through the navy seals and work his way up no he's probably a regular guy to some extent right um and the intrigue comes from same reason you moved to kenya right learning and adapting into a completely different culture where things happen that are not the same old same old in the other books right and it's, it's exactly yeah so your your disruption um uh, look for from a marketing standpoint for any business, including for you as an author, we always ask the first question. So what problem is Steve Raker solving? But right. So not, not writing an action thriller. That's not the the problem you're solving. I think the problem you're solving is to, to the people like me who have been reading these kind of books my entire life. um, You're probably, you're solving a problem of perhaps boredom of perhaps wanting something that goes back to the initial excitement of when we read the first books, my first Clancy book, my first Lee Child book. My favorite author, and I'm happy to say it, is Daniel Silva, uh, mm-hmm. who to some, to some extent is kind of like, like you, right? He's he is. close to me because he's writing about a Mossad Israeli agent, but he happens to be an art restorer who goes yeah, and read his book. Right? The guy, it's phenomenal. So to me, it's a combination of interesting, you know, Art restorer, Mossad agent, the intrigue. Uh, you're just like a, 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 a sort of like a spinoff of a guy in Kenya that's going through the subject matter and the stories in your books. Um, so, Steve, looking back in your uh, at, at your history, um, anything you would have changed? Not really, no. I'm quite happy with where I am. I, I often, my wife asked me the other day, Steve, have you got any regrets? And I said, well, regrets are like hindsight or or uh, or wishful thinking. You don't really know where, if you made that other decision, you don't even really know where it would have ended up because you didn't live that life. So I don't generally live with regrets or, or changing what I did. Um, I'd have liked to have been healthier. I'd have liked to drunk less and smoked less <laughs> over the years. But apart from that, really, uh, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with where I'm going. But one thing I would like to say is it, relating back to your last uh, statement about the books, we live in a very different world now than we used to. Amazon is everywhere. So from my little perch in my flat in Mombasa, I, I don't have to reach as many people as Lee Child reaches. I don't have to reach as many people as Tom Cancy reaches, but I'm talking, I'm I'm visibly in front of people in Australia, people in America, people in England. The American Amazon market is, is, you know, in the 60, 70 million range. So nowadays we don't have to be super successful. We can just be partially successful and still make 
enough money and enjoy to enjoy our lives and live our lives very well. This idea of success, I think you have to measure with, with different sets of scales because my level of success is my, my markers for success are freedom and being able to make my own decisions all of the time. And I don't need to be Lee Child to do that. I can be a tenth of Lee Child and I'd be over the moon with, with my turnover to, to be able to achieve that. So although the indie market is quite difficult to get in, you don't have to be completely immersed in it. You could just have your toes in it and still generate a, a nice income, a good income. You, don't, you may not become a multimillionaire or whatever that is, but you can achieve your goals without becoming the top bestseller in the country where everybody knows your name. Mm -hmm. So I think the world has changed a, a little bit a lot with this digital marketing, which is what I said why I was so interested in it, because I, I have quite a lot of my readers live in Australia, which, which is amazing. You know, I'm selling books in Australia from Kenya through Amazon, which is an American company. So it, I find... I find that side of it means that you don't have, I don't have to be the, the top of the field. I can be three quarters or, or halfway down the field and still be perfectly, perfectly happy with, with my lifestyle and the money I generate. Mm -hmm. So I believe nowadays things have changed slightly. You don't have to be Tom Clancy anymore. You can be a much lesser author, but still sell a lot of books. Yeah, and and uh, you know, from from strictly a marketing perspective, um, what has changed <clears throat> with the advent of the digital universe we live in that started somewhere in the early two thousands when the internet became uh, something we live by, is the fact that you can now reach a smaller audience that you could never do before in a very very targeted specific way uh which you couldn't do before and if you write a book of dreams of being tom clancy lee child or daniel silver one day uh, there's nothing wrong with having that dream no. but but you also have to be realistic that people that follow them loyal readers of tom clancy um who have limited amount of time to read in between their other chores and life duty duties of life whatever you want to call it uh if i have some free time and i'm going on vacation or on holiday as you brits call it and i want to take a book with me uh what well, which book am i going to read well if i oh, pick Tom a, Clancy, yeah if i pick a leech out book i know he's going to deliver more often than not if i pick a, this guy somebody told me about steve break and never heard of him the thing in the back of the book sounds interesting but honestly we as human beings, we don't like to take chances when we have this limited amount of time. What if I don't like the book? Then what? So the answer is don't market to the Clancy's and the Lee Child readers. That's not your market. Your market are sort of like people like me who appreciates them, but I don't run to buy their new books. I'm still excited about new thrillers and new protagonists because after a while you get, you know, you know what's going to happen with the same guy. You know, it's the same yeah, old yeah. story. Um, so last question, Steve. When you look back, what was one person that you feel influenced you the most in life? Not, not the author piece, but just in life. Um, probably the, the, biggest, the biggest effect on my whole life was actually my father. He sat me down when I was very young and he explained exactly how life works and he was very clear he was the one who gave me the responsibility and without the responsibility uh story i wouldn't have been any of these things i would never have had the confidence to do any of this stuff mm. so i think uh, i think he was he was the person that uh, influenced me the most uh, as far as famous people again i i find that very difficult because Generally, they're part of the establishment, and the establishment never really interests me. I enjoy leaders. I enjoy strong leaders. I enjoyed Margaret Thatcher. I was working in England during Margaret Thatcher, which was one of our English prime ministers, who was very stalwart and strong. But I also enjoy, uh, I, I read a lot about uh, Mr. Obama, 
and, and his development, which was a completely different style, but uh, he gave me a lot of, well, again, that's freedom with Obama. He was fighting for, for freedom of people. So I think I, I, I fell in love with him because of that. But uh, the most important person was probably my father. He, saw, he gave me the grounding, which he gave me at the very early age of, of 12 or 13. Yeah, and I think the, not to add, to end the podcast on a sad note, but when we, uh, you look at uh, yours and my generation and the answer is more often than not, it's one of the parents that played a key role. It's either the mother or the father. Um, and then you fast forward to today's generation and the millennials and their parents. And I kind of feel sad for them because those are, our parental generation does not exist anymore. So now yeah. one of the problems that, that I see and everybody else in, in my generation sees is that the parents more often than not cater to their kids as opposed to give them a life, less, life lesson, which was hard work being charged. Now we have a whole new generation of kids that grown up into, we call them digital natives. They were born into the internet and they think that life happens when you click the the return button on on your keyboard or on your phone, and I think uh, this is going to backfire because it doesn't really work that way. Uh, uh, so, we're but, showing our age now. <laughs> that's okay. I've got I got the white stuff here and, and gray. <laughs> okay, that's fine. I'm I'm not I'm not hiding behind anything, but <laughs> fine. So to to find Steve Breaker, go to Amazon. It's the place you could find him uh steve what steve has his own website what's the website again steve uh the website address is www.stevebreakerbooks.com easy easy enough you can uh, i guess you can purchase the books there but uh, for digital copies the stuff to go to amazon right or to go web. to amazon yeah yeah and just type in steve breaker author in the kindle section and i'll pop up it's african yeah. slaver is the first book uh I'm also on Instagram and Facebook under the same things. Just type in Steve Breaker. So I'm not here to my podcast. I'm very careful not using them as a self-promotion platform for my guests, Good. for myself. But uh, I do want to say that uh, after meeting you, I've started to read your book and you clearly for me delivered on the intrigue because it's different, right? It's not same old protagonist. MI6, CIA, Navy SEALs stuff. Uh, it's very, very interesting. And those they're, they're well written. And I would recommend to everybody to at least uh, try you out and maybe get sucked in and wait for the next ones. So thank you Steve, very much there. That's a wonderful thing to say. I really appreciate that. No, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm as honest as they come. And I wouldn't say it unless I felt that way. So uh, thank you again. It's It's been a thriller yeah. for me to have an action thriller on my podcast, <laughs> who happens to be an entrepreneur who was able to do something courageous and move his family to a different continent. So it was great. Thank you, Steve, for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you very much indeed.